Hello, welcome to module one, lesson two of our COSP Plus course. On this lesson, we're going to talk about infrastructure architecture principles such as reliability and resiliency, modularity, scalability, fault isolation, hierarchy, responsiveness, um, holistic design approach, and no gold plating. Network design is the philosophy that tells how different parts, protocols, and technologies should be put together and used based on certain approaches and principles to make a cohesive network infrastructure environment that can help businesses reach their tactical or long-term goals. This lesson, on the other hand, is about the design principles that network designers must keep in mind when making a network and turning business, functional, or application requirements into technical requirements. It is also important to realize that these ideas are not separate from one another. So if network designers want to make a good design that meets its goals, they should think about how each of these principles fits into the architecture as a whole. However, not all of these principles may be useful or necessary for every design. By using the top-down method, network designers can figure out what to focus on and what to think about. A reliable network sends most of the packets it accepts to the right place in a reasonable amount of time. Converged networks of today require maintaining a high level of reliability in order to meet the needs of today's enterprises. So even more important for these businesses, especially service providers, right, and modern financial institution, is that network, their network is seen as a way to make money. So as you will notice here, right, a five minute network outage that impacts X number of customers can cost a company hundreds of thousands of dollars. All right? So a key design principle is to have a highly reliable and available network architecture that can keep running even if the network component fails without any help from an operator. This is called resiliency, right? And it is a top priority for most businesses in the modern world. For the network to have the level of resilience that is needed, there must be a redundant part that can take over the whole or a failed part after a failure event. Okay, so that's reliability and um, resiliency. Let's talk about modularity. So in software development, modular design is often used, right? This is because an application can be built from multiple blocks of code that work together to make the desired applications. These building blocks of modular structure make the application architecture better and easier to use as a whole. Like for instance, if there's a problem in one block right here, There's a problem in one block, let's say this is the first block or module of that software. It is easy to separate it from the other modules and fix it on its own without affecting the other parts of the network like this one, right? This is still green. So also it is easier to add new modules or blocks to the structure. If new features are needed, which is good for making improvements over time. Okay, that's modularity. Modularity makes the application architecture as a whole more structured and easier to work with. In the same way, modularity is one of the main ideas behind a structured network. In a structured network, the architecture can be broken up into multiple functional modules. So here, right, each module has a specific role in the network and is represented by its own physical network. The places in the network, which includes the enterprise campus, right, uh, which is Enterprise Campus, the wide air network, and the data center are also part of the individual physical network. So as you will see here, you have a, uh, hmm. Of course, this should be a switch, right? Nobody's using a hub anymore. So you have a server here. So this is uh, one module. You have an internet part here, which is another module. You have um, the LAN, local area network, right? Where, where the clients are. You also have uh, wireless services in here, right? So these are different modules as you will see. 
right? It's easier to change something. Let's say if you want to change this hub to a switch, then it's not going to impact whatever is happening on the server side, on the data center, or on the internet, or on the wireless network. Maybe on the wireless, right? Because the, the APs are connected to the switches. But yeah, this is still modular. All right. Let's talk about the next concept, which is scalability. So one of the most important things a network designer should think about is how to design for growth. In fact, a successful scalable network is judged not only by its size, but also by how stable and reliable it is and how easy it is to manage and fix problems on. Like for example, a network may be set up so that it can grow to include thousands of routers, right? However, if one link or device fails, it can cause a lot of processing and CPU usage across the network, which could make it unstable. Even though it can grow to a large number of routers, this design cannot be called scalable in a good way. In the same way, a network may be made to grow to a large size, but it may also be hard to manage and troubleshoot, so any problems could take a long time to fix. This network is also not good, uh, not good, a good example of a scalable design. Okay, so let's say here, if this goes down, right, all of this routers reacts in processing, receiving all the changes in routes, which could increase its CPU utilization and impacting the users that is connected to them. So this is not very scalable. So of course, if you know how to properly design routing, right, you know how to properly design um what devices or hardware should be put in here right so you will be able to at least make a very scalable network so a successful scalable a successful right scalable design must have a network that is both easy to use and reliable in other words the added complexity of configuration and troubleshooting will outweigh any benefit of being able to grow by size alone All right, now let's talk about fault isolation. So most fault isolation boundaries are made so that if the fault model uh, fails, the system stops working. The word fail stop means that incorrect behavior um, doesn't spread past the fault isolation boundary. In other words, when designing a network, you have to think about how to stop a problem in one domain from spreading to the rest of the network. Let me give an example. So this is needed, right? So that the broken link or device in one part of the network doesn't cause extra work and delays across the whole network. For example, you can deal with this problem in routing design by using summarization and logical flooding domains. It is always recommended that complex networks, either physically or on the control plane layer, be logically contained, each in its own fault domain. All right, so here you will have a more stable, reliable, and faster network that is coming together. Also, this idea brings simplicity to the architecture as a whole and reduces operational complexity. In general, fault isolation stops network fault information from spreading across multiple network areas or domains. This makes network design more stable and speeds up the time it takes for the network to recover after a failure. Okay, like for example, in this illustration shown, if any network node or link fails, the effect will be felt by all devices on the campus network. After this failure, a lot of unnecessary work might be done. Right, so let's say, well, this is a router icon, but let's say these are switches, right? If, if one switch is sending a lot of packets because it's faulty or there's some bugs or field notices, and this might impact all of the switches within uh, it, within the broadcast domain, which could bring down um, the whole infrastructure, right? So best practice on a campus LAN, ensure that you don't spread the VLAN across a lot of switches. Maybe just limit it into two different, two switches so you have redundancy, right? Let's say you have a, a VLAN 10 here, right? You can also port channel this if you want. Yeah, just VLAN 10. The other VLANs put it on another pair of switch. So you have fault isolation. Okay, next is hierarchy. So adding hierarchy to the overall network design and within each domain or block can greatly simplify the design and increase its flexibility, 
making it easier to add more efficient places to isolate fault domains. This is because the network designer will have more choke points to collect traffic, topology information, and reachability information, which will help with the logical or physical isolation. So this figure shows an example of a common service provider network with two tiers, right? And each pop is also made up of more than one tier. The hierarchical structure makes it possible to control and limit the spread of failure across the core and between the different layers um, within each pop. Because of default isolation and control, like choke points between the several tiers provided by this design, the service provider is better equipped to adjust the future expansion needs, right, which is being scalable without increasing the complexity of the overall design. Okay. Let's talk about the responsiveness. So the term responsiveness refers to the set of design characteristics that a flexible architecture needs to have in order to adapt to changing business applications and functional requirements. For instance, the design should be able to support the rollout of secure mobility for both employees and visitors. In this case, a flexible architecture is needed to meet this new need and allow for quick deployment and integration with other systems without making major changes to the overall design. From the point of view of the network, this goal can be reached with a modular reliable design and the right architecture for the forwarding and control planes. When the architecture as a whole is very flexible, it will be much easier to adopt and integrate new business and technology needs in the future. This will also make it easier to set up implementations across the network. From a business point of view, this means that the network will be seen as a real service provider. Okay, next is the holistic design approach. Okay, so a holistic design is a common design principle that looks at the system being designed as a connected whole that could also be a part of something bigger. In other words, the holistic design approach focuses on how a system like an enterprise network works as a whole. There are many design options and, think, and things to think about for different types of networks such as enterprise network or service provider network. Each type of network can be or can meet different needs or solve different problems. And before applying any of the designs to any part of the network, it is important to always keep the big picture in mind and use the holistic design concept. If you don't, you'll use a siloed approach to the design, which will make the network look like a co uh, communication islands, right, siloed. This could lead to a less than ideal architecture with less performance, higher cost, and less freedom. Most importantly, this plan doesn't have a very big picture, so it's likely that um, communication between these islands won't work very well, and not to mention the added complexity to manage networks that were not engineered as a single architecture. Okay? That's the holistic design approach. Okay, so this one is important as well. No gold plating. So what's what does this mean? <clears throat> Okay, so gold plating is actually a term used in software engineering. Um, it's also used in project management um, and in general to describe a continuing to work on a project or task well past the point where the extra effort is worth the value it adds, right? So this idea fits perfectly with network design and can be thought of as one of the most important network design principles. Over-engineering or adding extra features and capabilities beyond the needs can be risky. In other words, a network designer may think that adding more features to the design will make the customer happier, but these extra features may take longer to implement and cost more. Like for example, the final product may cost more or you might need more licenses, while the design that doesn't have these features still meet the requirements. So, network designers must have a design that focuses on how to meet the requirements and make the network a business enabler instead of adding extra features that could hurt the business. Okay, that's no gold plating. Now, let's go to the case study. So, in this case work, uh, I'd like you to review your company's IT environment. In terms of network security, update the table with the known gaps and pain points of your IT environment. On the 
next column, right? Um, specific, specify the impact if not addressed. And on the last column, research how it will be addressed. Like for example, in terms of reliability and resiliency, a common gap is the lack of redundant firewall facing the internet on one of the data center. If this fails, internet traffic need to be rerouted to the secondary DC, which makes the architecture complex. To solve this architectural concern, you may want to add a redundant firewall, either on HA or clustered. Okay? So firewalls on HA is much more recommended. So firewalls in DC1 and DC2 are independent of each other, right? As compared to doing a uh, firewall cluster between DC1 and DC2, as they're not going to be, you know, independent of each other if it's clustered. Okay, so this is the case work. All right, that's the end of the lesson. In this lesson, we spoke about reliability and resiliency, uh, modularity, scalability, fault isolation, hierarchy, responsiveness, holistic design approach, and no gold plating. All right, thank you very much for watching the video.